Hey everybody, welcome to Mammoth Interactive's YouTube channel. First of all, I want to thank you for watching this video. And remember that this channel doesn't do Patreon, instead we sell our digital courses down below. And every single dollar that we get from the products you buy below goes into making more content. The best way to help out this channel and Mammoth Interactive is to subscribe to Mammoth Interactive's huge library of content. Get thousands of hours and hundreds of courses for a low, low price down below. We have a monthly option and a yearly option. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the video. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this lecture, we're doing a project overview of our upcoming project, Regression Machine Learning for Cryptocurrency Stocks. First, we're going to load our data and then we can build some linear regression models and other model types as well, other regression types. We'll start with linear regression, which we're going to build out and also implement the R2 score to calculate the accuracy of the model. Statistically, this R squared score is called the coefficient of determination. It represents the proportion of variance of Y that has been explained by the independent variables in the model. R squared provides a good indication of the fit of the model and therefore a measure of how well unseen samples are likely to be predicted. So we're measuring the model's performance with R squared. There's a value between 0 and 1 for no fit and perfect fit. The best possible score is 1, and the R squared score can be negative because a model can be arbitrarily worse. A constant model that always predicts the expected value of Y disregarding the input features would get an R squared score of 0. Results may vary given the stochastic nature of the algorithm or evaluation procedure and if you have differences in numerical precision. So you can run a few times and compare the average outcome of your R squared error. As well, we're going to build a polynomial regression model using scikit-learn. We're going to use polynomial features and we'll also have to scale our data before jumping into another regression type, support vector machines. We're going to use an RBF kernel and scale our data with the support vector regression model. This RBF kernel is short for radial basis function. This is the most generalized form of kernelization, one of the most widely used kernels because it's similar to the Gaussian distribution. As well, we have similarity to the k-nearest neighbors algorithm because this radial basis function has advantages of k-nearest neighbors and it overcomes the space complexity of k-nearest neighbors because the k-nearest neighbors is going to be able to store the entire data set which actually has a lot of space complexity whereas with radial basis we only have to store the support vectors so we can save a lot of space thanks to RBF. As well we will build a decision tree regressor and a random forest regressor. And that is our upcoming project. So don't miss the next lecture where we're going to get started with regression machine learning for crypto stocks. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we're going to compare regression techniques for cryptocurrency or stock machine learning. So join me at Google Colab where we can build and run our project. We're going to get our stock data from Yahoo Finance. So go to finance.yahoo.com and search up the stock that you want. Go to historical data and select your time period. And then you can download your stock data. You can also find a CSV file of this data at the end of this section in the source files. Once you have your data, go into Colab and upload the CSV file into your files. You can also upload the CSV file to Google Colab for more permanent storage. All right, now let's load our data. So I'm going to make a reference to the data path using eth-usd, the name of the file, .csv. Then I'm going to import the pandas library and use pandas.readcsv, passing in my data path. We can store the results as our data. And then we can inspect the data with the head function. All right, so here we have our stock data. We can also automatically set our index column to equal the date. We can infer the date time format and set parse dates to true. 
If you rerun this code cell, your index column will now be your date. Next, we're going to define our X and Y data for our regression technique. For regression, your prediction that you're trying to get should be in the form of a number that can be represented on a number scale. So our X data will be our data at the open column, and our Y data will be the data at the close column, which means we're going to use the X column to predict the Y column. You can also select multiple columns or create new columns and use other features to predict your Y. All right, next up, we are going to split our data for training versus testing. So we're going to import from scikit-learn.model selection the function train test split, and we're going to call the function train test split on our X and Y data. Our test size will be 20% of the data. We can also pass in a random state optionally. The result of this will be our training data for X, our testing data for X, our training data for Y, and our testing data for Y. And there we have that data. We can run the code cell and then we can inspect X train as well as inspect Y train. So we can print out the values and then run the code cells. And you should see they should have the same number of rows. And X contains open, Y contains close. And the date ranges should also match up. X train should match up with Y train and X test should match up with Y test. Okay, now that we have our data, let's create some models. So join me coming up in the next lecture where we're going to build different models and then we can compare the results. Hello everyone and welcome back to our project of comparing regression models for cryptocurrency machine learning. Previously we loaded our data and in this lecture we're going to use the data and build regression models to predict ETH price. So join me back in your collab project. We're going to start with linear regression. For that, we're going to import from scikit-learn.linearmodel the class linear regression. This has the setup for our model for us. So we'll call this our linear model and we'll instantiate a linear regression model. Then we'll take the linear model and fit it to our training data. That is the training process and then we can get our predictions using our linear model dot predict and feeding it the X test. Then we can evaluate the results with scikit-learn metrics and using the R2 score. And we can save our linear score by calling R2 score on our Y test, which is the actual Y versus our predictions. Right, then we can print out our linear score. Right, so that is the score for prediction using the linear regression model. Now, what if we want to try out other types? Well, we can try out other regression model types like polynomial regression and SVR, support vector regression, as well as decision tree regression and random forest regression. And we can apply different data science techniques as well, such as scaling. So we have linear regression. Let's add another code cell here. And from scikit-learn.preprocessing, I'm going to import polynomial features. Then I'm going to instantiate my polynomial with polynomial features. And I'm going to pass in my degree that I want to use for the polynomial, such as four. You can try out different degrees and you'll get different results. Then we want to get our X data with the polynomial features applied. So for that, we take the polynomial and we use the function fit transform and we're transforming our X training data. Then I'm going to instantiate another linear regressor and I'll call this my model and I'm going to instantiate the linear regression object. Then I'm going to take the model and fit it not with my X training data, 
but with my X polynomial data and my Y training data. The results we can store using our model.predict function. Here we're going to pass in our polynomial and transform the X test because if we transformed the X train, we should transform the X test. We can get our score using R2 underscore score and this will be our polynomial score. So let's save this as our polynomial score and call R2 underscore score. We're passing in our Y test and our predictions. All right, so then we can print out our polynomial score to see the results. Okay, so we get a very similar result to a linear regression. All right, next up, what other technique should we try? Let's use scaling as well as support vector regression. So first I'm going to scale our data. For that, I'm going to import from scikit-learn.preprocessing the standard scalar. Then I'm going to instantiate a scalar for my X and my Y data. So I'm going to create an X scalar with a standard scalar and a Y scalar for my standard scalar. All right, next I'm going to take my X training data and scale it. So for that, I take the X scalar and use the function fit transform and pass in my training data. Similarly, we can scale our Y training data using the Y scalar and calling fit transform on Y train. All right, then we can inspect some of that data such as the X train scaled. So you can see the range of the values are a lot different now because they've been scaled. All right, next step, we are going to use a support vector regression model. So for that, I'm going to import from scikit-learn.svm support vector machines, the support vector regression model. I'm going to instantiate an SVR model using the SVR class, and let's use an RBF kernel. Then I'm going to take my SVR model and fit it to my X train scaled and my Y train scaled. Then we can get our predictions using our Y scalar dot inverse transform on our results. So to get our results, I'm going to create a variable and use my SVR underscore model and use its predict function passing in the scaled text test data. So, so I'm going to create X test scaled using my X scalar dot transform on the X test data. Then for the prediction, I pass in X test scaled. And that is what we can send here to that predict function. As well, I'm going to call reshape and pass in negative one comma one. Then we can scale our results and we can print out our predictions to see how it went. But to really get a score, we need to evaluate the model performance. So I'm going to get my SVR score using R2 score, passing in my Y test and my predictions. And then we can print out that variable value. So let's print out the SVR score. I'm going to run the code cell and we can see our score there. All right, coming up next, let's try some more models. We're going to use tree models coming up next, the decision tree and the random forest. So don't miss the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our project comparing regression techniques for cryptocurrency machine learning. Previously, we loaded our data we built regression models, and in this lecture, we're going to build some more regression models, specifically of the tree types. So join me back in your project. We're going to start by importing from scikit-learn.tree the decision tree regressor. Then we can create our decision model using the decision tree regressor, and we can pass in optionally a random state. Then let's take the decision model and use the fit function to fit it on our training data. 
And let's then create a prediction using the decision underscore model dot predict function. And we have to pass in our X test data. Then we can get a score. We can get a decision score using the R2 score function, passing in the Y test compared with our predictions. Then we can print out the decision score that we get. Okay, so we get the lowest score we've had so far. Next up, let's try another tree type, the random forest regression model. For that, I'm going to import from scikit-learn.ensemble the random forest regressor. And we're going to instantiate the forest underscore model. For that, we use the random forest regressor. And we can pass in the number of estimators that we want, such as five, and optionally a random state. And note that whenever you change any of the parameters of the model, such as random state or whatever other parameters are available, you change the results. So you can try out different parameters. For now, let's take this forest model and let's call the fit function to train it on our training data. Then we can get our predictions by taking the forest model and we can call predict and pass it the X test data. Then we can get a score called a forest score using R2 underscore score. We're going to take the X test and compare it with our predictions. Then let's print out that forest score to see how the model performed. All right, so quite a high score. All right, so we've tried out several regression techniques. Now, how do we know which one is the best performing? Well, you can compare the results of your models, the R squared score, and see which one had the highest results. So join me coming up next, we're going to compare our model results. Hello everyone and welcome back to our project of comparing regression techniques for cryptocurrency machine learning. Previously we loaded our data and we built regression models. In this lecture we're going to compare the results of our models. So for that let's import the NumPy library and we're going to create a scores variable which will be a NumPy array. Here you can pass in a list of all of your scores, like your linear score, your polynomial score, your SVR score, your decision score, and your forest score. Then you can print out your NumPy array. All right, so here we have a list of all our scores. Now the one that is the highest score is the one that you'll likely want to choose because it's the best performing. So you can list out all of your scores as a data frame with the name of each model as well. So we're going to import pandas and create our data frame. For that we use pandas.dataframe. The data that we pass in will be our scores. The columns is going to be our R2 score. So we will have one column showing the score of each of our models. For the index we can pass in a linear followed by polynomial, and then we had SVR, support vector regression, decision tree, and we had random forest. Then we can print out our data frame to see our results. Okay, so here we have this data frame pasted out, where we can see in the index we have the name of the model, and then for the column we have the score for each model. So the highest performing model was the first one that we tried, the linear regression model. However, I encourage you to try out different models with different parameters and even using different data because all of those will affect your score. And you can build a more complex data frame to see all of your results. You can also inspect the head of the data frame with the head function to see it in a different format. All right, so we tried out five models, but again, you can edit all of the models. For example, let's go from the top with the linear regression model, you can feed it different data, different X and Y values, and see your results. For the polynomial model, you can change the polynomial degree to see how that affects your results. As well, you can try scaling or even normalizing the data to see if that affects your results. For the support vector regression, you can change the kernel type. You can try scaling or not scaling as well. 
Then for the decision tree regressor, you could change the random state and other properties that are part of the model. Currently, we're just using a lot of the default properties. And for random forest regression, you can change properties again, like the number of estimators, the random state, and the data that you feed. So that is how you can try out different machine learning models and then compare the results for crypto price prediction. In this lecture, we are doing a project overview of our upcoming project, AdaBoost Stock Prediction. First, we'll jump into what is AdaBoost regression. As a quick overview, AdaBoost is a subset of boosting models. You use multiple base prediction models to generate one strong machine learning model. The base learners are usually weak, but they could be strong. With AdaBoost, you can use this technique for regression or classification. Subsequent learners will cover the weaknesses of the previous learners, so you have machine learning models working together. The most common type of Ada boosting uses decision trees known as stumps as the base learners. So in this project, we're going to load our stock data set, and then we're going to build our Ada boost models for stock prediction. We'll start with a simple Ada boost regression model. And then we're going to learn how to tweak the model to find the best model for this data set. In order to evaluate our models, we have to calculate the model error. How much did the model go wrong? Because the model will give you a prediction, but then you have the actual data as well that you can compare. Was the model close in its predictions? One technique for calculating error is known as a mean absolute error, or MAE for short. Mean absolute error is one error metric. Mean absolute error will punish larger errors more than smaller errors, inflating or magnifying the mean error score. This is due to the square of the error value and with the formula behind the metric. Mean absolute error does not give more or less weight to different types of errors. Instead, the scores increase linearly as error increases. Mean absolute error is calculated as the average of the absolute error values. Absolute means that the number is positive, cannot be negative. Mean absolute error is calculated by the difference between the expected and predicted value. And it could be positive or negative, but it's forced to be positive when calculating mean absolute error. It's a good idea to first establish a baseline mean absolute error for your data set with a naive prediction model. For example, predicting the mean target value, the average. A model that achieves an error that is better than the mean absolute error for the naive model is good. And when we say better, we mean a lower. The less error, the better. A similar error metric is called mean absolute percentage error, or MAPE. We're going to use MAPE as well in our project when we compare different models. MAPE is the percentage equivalent of MAPE mean absolute error versus mean absolute percentage error. The equation for mean absolute percentage error looks just like that of mean absolute error, but with adjustments that converts everything into percentages. Mean absolute percentage error is one of the most commonly used key performance indicators to evaluate models. MAPE measures forecast accuracy, and its formula is the sum of the individual absolute errors divided by the demand, and then the average of the percentage errors. Let's compare mean absolute error with mean absolute percentage error. Mean absolute error calculates the average magnitude of error produced by your model. Mean absolute percentage error calculates how far the model's predictions are off from their corresponding outputs on average. Both mean absolute error and mean absolute percentage error give you a clear interpretation since Percentages are easy for people to understand, and mean absolute error are, is straightforward. Both are robust to the effects of outliers, because sometimes in data there are some outliers or data that is off the charts. But these error metrics are robust despite outliers, thanks to the absolute value. Mean absolute percentage error is more limited than mean absolute error. Many of mean absolute percentage errors weaknesses actually stem from the use of 
dividing because we have to scale everything by the actual value and MAPE is undefined for data points where the value is zero. Mean absolute percentage error can grow unexpectedly large if the actual values are really small. MAPE is biased towards predictions that are systematically less than the actual values. As well, mean absolute percentage error will be lower when the prediction is lower than the actual compared to a prediction that is higher by the same amount. Another error metric is MSE, or mean squared error. This refers to the sum of the squared differences between the prediction and the expected value. As always, a low error metric is good. The MSE, or mean squared error, calculates the mean or average of the squared differences between the predicted and the expected target values. So you subtract predicted minus expected, and square, then get the average. Squaring has the effect of inflating or magnifying large errors. The larger the difference between the predicted and the expected values, so the more error, the larger the resulting squared positive error. Because if you square something, you're going to increase its value by a lot. The effect is punishing models for large errors if you use mean squared error as a loss function. So these different error metrics, they can give you slightly different insights, such as mean squared error will tell you if you have larger errors. Because mean squared error, it cares more about larger errors. As well, mean squared error will punish models by inflating the average error score if it's used as the metric. Another error metric is root mean squared error, very similar to mean squared error. This is the square root of mean squared error. So you just take the mean squared error and you get the square root. That's it. The units of RMSE are the same as the original units of the target value. So the effect is if you want the same units as you did for your original data. For example, if your target variable is trying to predict price of a house in dollars. The root mean squared error score will have the unit of dollars, whereas mean squared error, the error score would have the unit squared dollars. So by, by square rooting, by getting the root, we go back to the original unit. It's common to use mean squared error to train a regression model, and then root mean squared error to evaluate or report the performance of the model. And that is an overview of our upcoming project. So join me in our next lecture where we will get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are introducing the AdaBoost machine learning model because coming up next, we're going to build an AdaBoost classifier to predict heart disease with our data set. Let's get started first by talking about the Ada Boost classifier. An Ada Boost is an ensemble model because it combines multiple machine learning models, for example, multiple decision trees. Gradient boosted trees are where you have trees in iteration. Gradient boosting, the origins came from how can you improve a bad model and can you even improve a bad machine learning model? Can a weak learner be modified to become better? A weak learner meaning a weak machine learning model. A weak learner technically is where accuracy is only slightly better than random chance. For example, if you have two classes, red and blue, that you're trying to classify a sample into, if your model's accuracy is 51%, well, that's only slightly better than just guessing and being right 50-50. The first success of gradient boosting came from Ada Boost, so it's an early machine learning model type, and there have been many successors. So there are many other types that are similar to Ada Boost. The goal of Ada Boost is to combine multiple weak learners into one strong learner. So you take several weak decision trees and you use them together because together they produce a strong output. With Ada Boost, you weigh your observations and put more weight on hard to classify samples. For example, if some of your patients are very hard to classify, you put more weight on them and less weight on the patients that are easy to classify. Because in a, in a decision tree model, if 
a patient is easy to classify, it means they're early on in the decision tree chain. Early on, they will be classified, whereas a patient that is hard to classify, they will take more and more branches of trees. With Ada Boost, new weak trees are added sequentially, one after the other. You add new weak decision trees. And you focus your training on the more difficult patterns, because why train something that is easy to predict? So you focus instead on the samples that are hard to predict. Samples that are hard to classify get increasingly larger weights until the algorithm finally finds a model that correctly classifies these samples. Predictions are made by majority vote of the weak learner's predictions. So you have several decision tree models and potentially some of them give different results. So you take the majority vote. So if you have four trees and three of them have the same output, but one of them has a different output, you take the majority output. And the predictions are weighted by their individual accuracy. Ada Boost was initially successful for binary classification where you only have two classes that you are trying to put a sample into, one of two. Gradient boosting is generalized Ada Boost, which cast boosting as a numerical optimization problem. So if, if you ever hear about gradient boosting or gradient boosted trees, this is a generalized form of Ada Boost, which made boosting into a numerical optimization problem. The goal being to reduce the model loss, to improve the model. Weak learners are added in a gradient descent-like process. One new weak learner is added at a time and existing weak learners are left unchanged. This stage-wise additive model supports regression, binary classification, multi-class classification, and more. So Whereas Ada Boost was initially built for binary classification, it, it was an extended, so with stage-wise models, you can classify a sample into one of several classes. Gradient boosting is an ensemble machine learning technique. So you are using an ensemble of models. An ensemble meaning a group of models instead of just one model for your task. And gradient boosting works for classification or regression problems. With boosting, trees are added one at a time to the ensemble, and they are fit to correct the prediction errors made by prior models in the chain. With training, you can use any differentiable loss function and gradient descent optimizer. With gradient boosting, the loss gradient is minimized as the model trains, and this is similar to a neural network. There are three elements to a gradient boosted model, a loss function, a weak learner, and an additive model. The loss function is what is to be optimized. One example is mean squared error. The weak learner is used to make predictions. One example is a decision tree. And an ensemble of weak learners it was, is what creates the gradient boosting. An additive model adds weak learners to minimize the loss function. So this is like the manager that is going to add more models. And that is how Ada Boosting works and how it was extended for more complex problems. So join me coming up in our next lecture. We are going to build an Ada Boost classifier ourselves to use our heart disease data set to predict heart disease. Welcome back to our project, building an Ada Boost regression machine learning model for stock prediction. In this lecture, we're going to load our crypto stock data set for our machine learning project. So join me in Google Colab. We're going to create a new code cell and use pip to install the Y Finance library. Then we're going to import Y Finance. We can run the code cell and that is going to install the Yahoo Finance library to allow us to get stock data. Once we've imported the library, we can create a new code cell and we can use the library to create our data. So I'll use the function yfinance.download. I'm going to download the Bitcoin USD stock and pass in a start date of 2021-0101 and an end date of 2022-0101. So we'll have one year's worth of the stock. Then we can inspect the head of the stock with the head function. We can also inspect the tail with the tail function. Next, we're going to reshape our data for machine learning. So I'm going to create a new code cell 
and I'm going to floor the data. So for this, I'm going to import math, a, another library, which has helper functions for working with mathematical equations and formulas in Python. I'm going to get my index for the data by using math.floor, taking my data.shape at index zero. So what is data.shape? Well, we can actually print out the data.shape of our data frame, and we can see how many rows we have, 366, and how many columns, six. That is the number of features excluding the index column. Then I'm going to multiply this by the amount that I want for training. So I'm going to here create a constant called training amount, and I'm going to use 0.8, so 80% of the data for training. So this means we're going to take our number of rows, which I can create a variable called rows, and get the data dot shape at index zero. We're going to multiply the rows by the training amount to get the rows for training and then floor that. The reason we want this is because I want to split my data into training and testing. So I'm going to create here my train X data by grabbing the data and selecting my feature columns like the open column, the high column and the low column, the opening price, the high price and the low price on each day. I want to also get them up to the index. Then I'm going to use the toNumPy function to convert the values to a NumPy array. This will give us the X or the independent variables or features for training. Then we can inspect train X by printing it out. So we get our values returned. Okay, so here we have our X for training. Let's also get our Y for training. So I'm going to create train Y, grabbing my data at the column that I want to predict, which is the closing price. As well, we want to get it up to the index because this is for training. Next, for testing, let's create test X. We're going to grab our data at the same columns for X, but this time the index is going to be starting at the training index and then going to the end of the data set and converting to the NumPy type. Because first we use the 80% for training, then we use the remaining 20% for testing. Similarly, we're going to define the test Y variable by grabbing our data at the close column, what we're trying to predict, and taking the data at the index column, or not at the index column, but rather at the index row, and going to the end. So the last 20%. The first 80% is for training, the last 20% is for testing. Okay, so great, now we have our data, we can run our code cells and we can inspect the data if we wish, such as test Y. What we really care about is the shape, so we can inspect the shape of train X by getting the shape property because it's a NumPy array. So we have 292 rows and three columns. For train Y, it's not a NumPy array, so we can grab the length of train Y because it's just a regular array. And it has 292 samples with just one value per sample, not three, because we only have the close column. Similarly, we want to inspect test X dot shape. Let's run the code cell. Okay, so we have 74 rows and three columns. Then we want to get the length of test Y and we should get 74 samples because for each X there must be a Y. All right, so for that, we have now created our stock data set. So coming up next, we're going to build our model. So don't miss the next lecture. Welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to build an AdaBoost regression machine learning model for cryptocurrency stock prediction. Previously, we loaded our data set for the model. And join me back in your project where we're going to create the model itself. So first we have to load in the model. I'm going to import from scikit-learn.ensemble the class Ada Boost Regressor. This is a class that outlines the features and functions that the model needs and the structure, the layers that the model needs, all the equations and the formula. If you're interested, you can look at the code behind this class. Then let's create our model by instantiating a variable called model and then calling ada boost regressor the constructor. 
right? So that will create for us the model. Then we can call model.fit and fit it on our training data, train X and train Y. We can run the code cell and that is going to train our model. Once the model is trained, we can use it for a prediction. So we can create here a predictions variable and we can call the model.predict function on our test X data. Then we can print out our model's predictions. Just make sure you spell model correctly. Right, so here we have an array listing out all of the predicted Y for each test X sample. Let's format this into a pandas series. So I'm going to import the pandas library, which is pre-installed because we're on Colab, but we have to import it. Then we're going to create our predictions series. And I'm going to use pandas.series passing in our predictions and our index, which is going to use the test y dot index for the series. Then we can print out the predictions series and I'm going to run the code cell. Okay, so now instead of just being a regular list, we have a series object thanks to the pandas library to store our predictions. So we have a bunch of predictions, great, but how do we actually know if they're accurate or not? Well, we can use an error metric to calculate the error of our model. So for this, I am going to define a function for the map error or map. I'm going to pass in two values, the predictions versus the actual y. So you can also call this predicted y versus actual y. Here, I'm going to return the error. So how do I calculate error? Well, we're going to use the NumPy library for this. So you have to import NumPy, which is pre-installed into Colab. Then we can use NumPy.mean to get the average and then use apps to get the absolute of one minus the predictions divided by the actual Y. So this is the formula for calculating MAPE or mean absolute percentage error. Okay, so this will give us our error. All we have to do is call the function and pass in our predictions, which is going to be our predictions series, and pass in our test y, which is the actual y. Then we can print out the results of that function call. So we get 0.02. If you want to represent that as a percentage, then you can store this error. So I'm going to here create an error variable and rerun the code cell. Then I'm going to print out the error times 100 to see the value as a percentage. So the error was about 2%. All right, so that tells us the functionality of the model. How well did it perform? But we can also visualize the error because 2% might not make much sense to you unless you have a visual. So Let's use PyPlot to create a visual. For this, I'm going to import matplotlib.pyplot as PyPlot, and I'm going to call PyPlot.plot, and I'm going to plot my predictions series. Then run the code cell, and you'll see this chart appear. If you want to make this chart a bit bigger, then we're going to change the properties of PyPlot. So I'm going to call PyPlot.RCParams and change the figure.FigSize parameter to a value of 20 by 10. Then if you rerun the code cell, every figure from then on will be larger. You can also change the font size with PyPlot.RCParams.Update. Here we're going to pass in font.size and change it to 18. I'm going to rerun the code cell and now our font size is bigger as well. So what do we have on the Y axis? On the Y axis, we have our predicted price for our Bitcoin stock. So I'm going to call pyplot.ylabel and set it to the stock price. Then if you rerun the code cell, your Y axis will have a label. The X axis is the date and the line is our predictions series, the prediction that the model made. Now let's compare the model's predictions with the actual values. 
So for that, we can just add pyplot.plot again in the same code cell and call test y. So we're going to plot our test y series. In blue, we have our model's prediction. In orange, we have the actual values. So we can see that the model's prediction actually comes quite close to the actual values for the price stock on a day. All right, so that is how you can build an ADA boost regression model for cryptocurrency stock prediction, and then evaluate the model's performance. And finally, we can visualize the results. But this here is an example of using an ADA boost regressor where we didn't change any properties. We just called the ADA boost regressor as is, but we can actually adjust the properties of the ADA boost regressor to fine tune it and try to see if we can get a better model. So join me coming up next where we're going to learn how we can tweak the model and find the best possible structure for the model given our data. In this lecture, we are going to learn how to find the best machine learning model with an optimal number of estimators. Previously, we built our cryptocurrency stock data set for the project. We also built an ADA boost regression model for the project. Now we're going to fine tune the model to see if we can find the properties or structure for the model that will give us the best results for this data set. For an ADA boost regressor, you can change the number of estimators in your ADA boost regressor and find what will, should be the best number of estimators. So for this, we're going to create a new function in our project. I'm going to define a function called find best number of estimators. Here we're going to pass in a data frame, a maximum depth for the estimators a maximum number of estimators and a test ratio. So these will be the three values that we want to put to use. So we have data frame, the max depth of the trees, the maximum number of estimators and the test ratio. In here, we can now create a new loop to loop through each of our estimators, so each of the number of estimators. So we're going to try out different estimators in a loop. We'll start with one and we're going to go up to the maximum estimators plus one because the range function is exclusive of that outer boundary. So if we want to include max estimators, we want to add one. We're going to grab an index by using math.floor and taking our data at the zeroth index, so that refers to the number of rows. So we can create a rows variable and pass that in. So we're going to get our rows and multiply them by 1 minus the test ratio. The test ratio is how much of the data set we're using for testing. In this case, we're using 20%. So that's our index. Then we can use the index to generate our training and testing data. So we're going to create train x grabbing our data at the open column, the high column, and the low column, and up to our index. So starting at the front and up to our index. Then we're going to convert it to a NumPy array type. To create our train Y, we're going to grab our data at the close column, which is what we're trying to predict, and again, grab it up to the index. Okay, so that will generate our data, and we can already test out the function, but we will have to add more to it. So how would we call this function? We would pass in our data, our max depth, such as 3, our maximum number of estimators, such as 100, and our test ratio, 0 0.2. So those are the four values that the function needs. You can run the code cell just to verify that your function runs. Next up, let's create our testing data for each of our number of estimators. So I'm going to create test x by grabbing my data at the open column, the high column, and the low column, and grabbing it starting at the test index this time. So careful about where you place your index and your colon. We're starting at the test index and we're going to the end. Then we're going to convert it to a NumPy array. For the test y, we're going to grab our data at the close column, and again, start at the index and go to the end. So we can run our code cell again just to verify that everything works. 
Next up, we're going to create the base model for our group, our ensemble. The base model will be a decision tree regressor because typically for ADA boosting, decision trees are used as the base for the ensemble. Although, of course, you can use different regressors as well. So in order to use the decision tree regressor, we do have to import from scikit-learn.tree the decision tree regressor. This is the class that contains the whole structure for the decision tree regressor. And you can take a look at the code behind that class if you're interested in how the model was made. The max depth we're going to pass in as our argument for this decision tree. Then we're going to create our ensemble model, which is the ADA boost regressor. For this, we can pass in a base estimator, which is going to be our base model. And actually, you could experiment with the max depth as well if you wanted to, finding the optimal max depth. But for now, we're starting off with the optimal number of estimators, which is the n estimators property, which you can pass as our number of estimators. Because remember, we're looking for this on loop. So we're going to loop from 1 to the max, inclusive. And therefore, we're going to create a model that uses the decision tree as the base for the ensemble and the number of estimators we're going to try out in on loop. Then we'll get the results for each model version. We're going to call model.fit to train the data on our train X and train Y. Then we can get our predictions by calling model.predict on our test X and we can compare our results. So we can get the error of the model by using our MAPE function for the mean absolute percentage error, passing in our predictions as well as our test Y. So we're comparing the prediction versus the actual results. Next up, we want to store all of our errors. So I'm going to create outside of the for loop a results variable that uses pandas.series and then inside of that list, that series, I'm going to take results and add into it at the location of the number of estimators. I'm going to pass in my error. Then outside of the loop again at the very end, we can return our results. All right, so then we can run this code cell to make sure everything works. This may take a little bit of time to run because it has to go through 100 maximum estimators. So be patient here as it runs for a few seconds. We see our value printed out as a result, the results. So you might want to save that in a results variable outside of the function. So let that code cell run again. Then we can print out our results once the function is done. And we get this pandas series, which has the error for each of our models of which we created 100. How did we create 100? Well, remember, our maximum estimators was 100. And we looped through from 1 to 100. And we created a model for each of those number of estimators. And then we stored the results. So this way, we can now compare what was the best number of estimators. And you can actually do this for each of your properties, like max depth. You can do it for any property to find out what's the optimal value for this data set. Next, we can visualize our results. So I'm going to call pyplot.plot, .plot, and I'm going to plot my results. I'm going to run the code cell to see our graph. Let's understand this graph. The y-axis is the error. So I'm going to call pyplot.y label in the same code cell, and I'm going to call the y-axis the error. We can see the error ranges from 0.02 to 0.04. If the error is low, that is a good sign. Then on the x-axis from 0 to 100, this is the number of estimators. So I'm going to call pyplot.xlabel and add number of estimators. That way, if we come back to this one day, we'll be able to understand what was happening in this graph. You want to find the lowest error for the number of estimators, which I can see is around 19. That means 19 is our optimal number of estimators for this actual data set and this model. You can also sort the values by grabbing your results and calling sort values. 
This is going to sort all of your results. All right, so then you'll see as a result from 0 0.02 all the way to 0 0.04. And you can see actually, okay, 15, not 19, but 15 was the lowest and seems like the first two actually have the exact same, 15 and 18. So that means we can choose 15 or 18 as our optimal number of estimators. So sometimes it helps to sort the values and get a numerical answer because the graph can be a bit vague if you don't have all the ticks here. So 15 or 18 is our best number of estimators. So what does this tell me? This tells me that I can now create the model again and use my final model with my final number of estimators. And that will be 15. So previously we had a, the default number of estimators. Then we tried out a hundred number of estimators. And finally, we can just pick one. So I'm going to create my base model again, this time outside of my function, outside of any loop. That is going to be the decision tree regressor. My max depth, you can pass in the same one, three. But remember, you can actually try out different values for max depth as well. Then I'm going to create my model, my ADA boost regressor, passing in my base estimator, which is my base model. And my number of estimators, well, we found that we could use 15 or 18 as the best one. Then we can call model.fit on our training data, train X and train Y. Then we can get our predictions by calling model.predict on our test X. And we can print out our predictions. I'm going to run the code cell and we get our list of predictions. But how do I actually understand if the predictions were correct? Well, we can compare with an error metric. So I'm going to create my predictions series with pandas.series, passing in my predictions list, and my index will be the test y.index. Then we can print out our predictions series to inspect our new format. Then I can call my mean absolute percentage error, passing in my predictions and my test y and multiplying by 100. Then we can print out the results to get our mean absolute percentage error as a percentage. So we get 2.2. We can use other error metrics as well, like mean squared error and root mean squared error. First, let's visualize our results. So to visualize the results of our new model with our optimal number of estimators, I'm going to call pyplot.plot and plot out my predictions. I'm going to run the code cell and we get our predictions in blue. In the same code cell, I call the plot function on my test y and that gets added to the plot. Let's see, we just have to make sure that we have the test y and the predictions in the correct format. So the predictions should be the predictions series. So just make sure when you're calling your error and you're plotting that you do it on the series. So now we can compare our models predictions in blue and our actual values in orange. All right, so we have 2.2. If we go back to the very beginning, remember we had 2.2 as well for our initial mean absolute percentage error, but this time it is a bit lower. So by finding the number of estimators, we've been able to drop that error a bit more, which is a good sign. We can also use different error metrics like mean squared error and root mean squared error. These are different ways of evaluating the model. So let's start with mean squared error. We're going to take in predictions and actual underscore y. The formula for mean squared error is going to be First, let's return the error. To create the error, we're going to call numpy.mean or average, passing in our real, which is our actual y minus our predictions, and then to the power of two. Then we can call our mean squared error on our predictions series and our test y to grab our results. Okay, so there's our mean squared error. And we can also get root mean squared error, which is very similar. So you just add an r, to the name of our function for our function name. And as well, you're going to take your error, which is going to be the mean squared error this time. And to get the root mean squared error, you just take the numpy dot square root of the mean squared error. 
and that's it. Then you can return the root mean squared error. All right, so a different metric here for calculating and evaluating the model. So congratulations, everyone. You now know how to load stock data into Google Colab with Python, how to visualize the data, how to build an AdaBoost regression model, and then how to tweak the model to find the optimal number of estimators. I encourage you to tweak other properties as well, like the data that you use, the number of samples for training and testing, and other values for the actual model structure, as we saw for our decision tree. Here we can change the max depth and actually many other properties, which you can see by going to the class for the decision tree regressor from scikit-learn. The official documentation will tell you all of the properties available. Same thing for the AdaBoost regressor. You could change the base estimator, the number of estimators, and many other properties. Anytime you change a property, you'll get a different result. Anytime you change the data, you'll also get a different result. And anytime you run the model, you'll get a different result because each time you run, it begins at a random place. So congratulations everyone on building this project. Join me in our next lecture where we'll continue our course. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this course. If you want to watch the rest of the course, the link is down below. Not only will you get the access to this course, but you'll get access to a lot of other courses in a huge bundle. And it's on sale today. So buy it before the sale ends. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.